This is the moon as seen from Northern California. I used my Nikon Coolpix P900 to record this. It's actually pretty amazing how close I can zoom in on it. Just how clearly I can see it, even in the daylight. I can actually zoom in closer to craters to look at those if I want it. Yeah, I've gotten pretty good at zooming in on this stuff in the sky. This is Jupiter. It's a planet, as I'm sure you've heard. It's one of the gas giants. I didn't really know very much about Jupiter or much about anything in outer space until I started recording the sky using my camera. But you can see this here. Jupiter looks really cool. It seems to have waves running through it. There's a flickering within it. And it looks a lot like a glowing light. This is Venus. Venus is the second planet from the sun. It's the second brightest natural object in the night sky after the moon. If you didn't know, Venus is a terrestrial planet and it's sometimes called Earth's sister planet or twin because of their similar size, similar mass, similar proximity to the sun. Here's Venus slowed down a bit. Venus seems to have waves running through it too. Venus isn't the only object in the sky that does this though. So let's look at a few stars. This is Vega. It's the fifth brightest star in the night sky, and it's the second brightest star in the northern hemisphere, which is where I'm at in the United States. But just look at it. There are some really unique colors in there. It also looks like it's pulsing and waving and moving around inside of it. It also has these ring-looking things going around inside of it from its center to the edges. And just like Venus, Vega has some kind of dot right in the middle of it. But let's look at another star. So this is Arcturus. Arcturus looks like a disco ball with so many amazing colors flashing inside of it. Arcturus is the fourth brightest star in the sky and the brightest star in the Northern Celestial Hemisphere. It's straight up amazing and beautiful. This is Polaris. It's also called the North Pole Star, which is also in the Northern Hemisphere. Notice how this star doesn't move across the frame of my camera. Remember how all of the previous objects I showed you so far, they moved pretty quickly across my lens when I recorded them. Well, as you may know, Polaris doesn't move more than a degree, and all of the circumpolar stars in the northern hemisphere rotate around Polaris. I'm curious if you've ever seen recordings of planets or stars in the night sky like what I just showed you, because there's no doubt the moon looks the same as what you've probably seen, but when it comes to planets and stars, I bet that you've primarily seen images like these. I think it's odd how different these online images look versus what I actually recorded and what I actually observed with my camera. I just wish that some of the normal observations came up at the top of some of the online searches I do. I found a lot of things odd and kind of strange and surprising recently. And that didn't start happening until this year, 2017, because I actually started looking up. I started looking at the daytime sky, started looking at the clouds and how different they can be from one day to the next. I looked at planes flying across the blue sky. I looked at the sun behind the clouds. I looked at the clouds floating across the sky and I started paying attention to the moon in the daytime, in the nighttime started looking at the moon's different phases, its different colors. This is a waxing crescent moon. This is a full moon. And like I mentioned earlier, I bought a unique camera to record all of this. It's the Nikon Coolpix P900. I bought it to personally study all of these things as I looked up and took some interest in the sky. And my interest in the sky and my studies they led me to look into the missions in outer space. First, I looked into the Apollo missions to the moon. Then I wondered why we hadn't been back to the moon in 45 years. I wondered why even now we didn't at least have a fleet of rovers scouring every inch of the moon, including its other side that we didn't even land on. But apparently there's a competition to get rovers on the moon. But I mean, we have a rover on Mars. Why didn't we at least send one rover up to the moon to constantly observe it since we no longer send humans? It's just hard for me to imagine that we've already discovered and observed everything we could learn about the moon during those three years of Apollo missions. You know, we've never put a woman on the moon, only men. 
So why not send our first woman to the moon? That would be a spectacular accomplishment. At least I think so. But then I came across a video of Don Pettit. He's a very outspoken NASA astronaut who's been to outer space three times. He said this is why we haven't been back to the moon. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology and it's a painful process to build it back again. Then I found out about the Van Allen radiation belt. Here's what a NASA engineer has to say about the Van Allen radiation belt. We are headed 3,600 miles above Earth, 15 times higher from the planet than the International Space Station. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. So yeah, I found it really interesting what that NASA engineer said about the Van Allen belt. And it turns out that other NASA folks have said the same thing about leaving low Earth orbit. And what comes after the International Space Station once its mission is over? How do we ensure the presence of humans in space? Well, that's a great question. Uh, the plan that NASA has is to build a rocket called SLS, which is a heavy lift rocket. It's something that is, that is much bigger than what we have today. And it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board, as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to, via, to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And this new system that we're building is going to allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to. And we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. These are technologies that we're testing out on Space Station are definitely helping us with our goals of going beyond low Earth orbit. So we have a really robust exploration program at NASA. And here's a quick look at the technology that we used to make it to the moon. Here's an image of the command module being rescued in the ocean. This made it to the moon and through the Van Allen belt and back to Earth. Here's video of a command module taking off from the moon. Here are some images I downloaded from NASA's website showing the module and a close-up of the technology that we sent to the moon. So yeah, I was surprised to hear about the Van Allen belt because we went to the moon nine times and sent 12 men during the Apollo missions from December of 1968 to December of 1972. I'm kind of a detail-oriented guy. So I wanted to learn more about all this because while I'm detail oriented, I'm also pretty cynical and extremely curious about things that don't immediately click. But I got sidetracked during my research because I came across Neil deGrasse Tyson saying something kind of weird. If you didn't know, Neil deGrasse Tyson is an astrophysicist and he's pretty well known inside the science community. So here's what he said. <laughs> so, um... Uh... So, so you spin, you know, when you spin pizza dough, it kind of flattens out. Yeah. It gets wider in the middle. And so Earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning. And it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere. It's, an, it's oblate. And officially, it's an oblate spheroid. That's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby is a good way. It's like pear-shaped. I researched this statement because it didn't make sense to me. And yeah, if you watch the whole video of when he says this, he gets into sea levels and more. But I got to tell you, he didn't mean the statement as a joke. But it still seems like a joke because who says the earth is pear-shaped? Pretty odd, right?
Either way, his statements and my research led me to download just more images and more videos from NASA's actual website. These are a few of their images of Earth that they took from space. And as I was downloading and researching photos and videos at NASA's website of our first moon landing, yeah, the Apollo 11 mission, I discovered something pretty crazy. Apparently, NASA lost the tapes that recorded data of the original Apollo 11 moon landing in 1969. The tapes included biomedical data on astronauts, video footage of the Apollo 11 landing, and all of their telemetry and engineering data. But based on everything I can research, it seems that NASA actually lost not just the Apollo 11 telemetry data, but NASA lost all of the telemetry data from all of the Apollo missions that landed on the moon. That's well over 10,000 lost tapes and over a ton, literally a ton in weight of missing tapes. Fortunately though, they were able to restore the original moon landing footage that was broadcast to Earth. I guess I just found it pretty odd when you consider that the moon landing is one of the, if not the, greatest accomplishments by mankind. Because I figured NASA would take really good care of that stuff and properly label boxes and reams of recordings. Okay, so that seemed pretty careless. But then I stop and think, wouldn't right now be the perfect time to go back to the moon? We've made significant breakthroughs in technology in the past 45 years. So imagine today's technology that NASA could bring to the moon to record and study it. Imagine the beauty that they could show the entire world. Because we could have crystal clear, high definition footage taken directly from the surface of the moon. I mean, 4K resolution stuff that would blow everyone's minds. But instead, everyone seems to be okay with not going back. And that's despite the original video of our first ever moonwalks during the Apollo 11 mission being destroyed. And they say the original recordings, they were actually super clear and nothing like the grainy video that was broadcast to millions on television. But I guess it doesn't really matter either way since we destroyed the technology to get back to the moon. That's if you believe what Don Pettit said. So my curiosity compelled me to keep researching all of this stuff. And a lot of what I found it didn't make a whole lot of sense. Like, why does it look like this flag is flapping or blowing in the wind? And this module taking off looks pretty weird to me. So yes, a lot of the moon landings and stuff surrounding outer space can come across as odd. And yeah, maybe each odd thing can be explained away. It's just that when I look at all of the oddities as a whole, it's a bit creepy. And I say creepy because someone I know and someone I love once said this stuff was creepy when they started looking into it. And all of this creepy stuff made me want to keep researching and keep asking questions. But I ended up asking one question that can get you labeled as a nutcase. It's a question that makes people laugh at you. It's a question that I bet you've already seen coming as you've been watching this video. And that question is, did we really go to the moon? I'm sorry, Jay. No, I'm no, sorry. I, I could see that how that would affect your Christmas. I made, I made that whole thing up. What? Uh, I'm sorry. I guess I just wanted to seem interesting. I, I guess there's a, there's a real danger of that on this show. But there's a pressure. Of, well, yeah. Guess. People come yeah, out sure. and they just they've run out of anecdotes, you know, yeah. and they and uh, and they just start making stuff up. Yeah. Like that Neil Armstrong guy. Have you seen him on the talk shows? Neil Armstrong, you mean the first man to walk on the moon? Talk about a fish story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Man, and they're buying it. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yep, we all know that people get labeled crazy or get called conspiracy theorists for questioning the Apollo missions or if we ever went to the moon. But please stay with me here, okay? I promise that I've really given this a lot of thought and I've considered how something like this could actually happen. And since we no longer send people to the moon, I started looking into other info and footage surrounding outer space. And I found some interesting things there too. This is Gemini 4 that was completed in June of 1965. That was well before the Apollo 11 mission. This is the first American spacewalk recorded using an 18 millimeter lens camera, and it recorded at six frames per second. 
but straight up, this looks like stop motion video to me. Back to what's odd. And it's that I can't find any other video of astronauts turning their helmets. A turning helmet appears to be only happening during this first ever spacewalk. Because the thing is, is that my research showed that the helmets couldn't turn or swivel because they're fixed to an airtight ring base. And once the suit is pressurized, it all becomes extremely stiff. And I don't see the helmet turning again in any of the video for this spacewalk or any others. But there's a lot of footage available that's been taken from the International Space Station, the ISS. This is it here. Of course, a lot of live interviews and videos have been done and recorded from the ISS, and that's resulted in a lot of footage to look at. First, and this one's just kind of really funny to me, it turns out that there's a lot of weird looking hair on the space station. It's like the hair is gelled or hairsprayed up, like straight up, and it's not supposed to move. Why not just let it flow and showcase its weightlessness? Maybe it would get in the way, but there are also ponytails and such, right? You look like you're in a studio, maybe in Omaha, Nebraska or something. The, the, the shot is so clear. Is this a hoax? Are you really in space still? See the hair? Okay, this is a good place to freeze for a moment and transition. Because things go from questioning weird hair to deeper levels of strange. See the hair? <laughs> I don't know. We're going to have to do something for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, I can do that. Watch this. It looks like this guy is grabbing a wire attached to the guy next to him. He's not grabbing air, and there is no reason why any of these guys would be wearing wires in space. Someone I know wondered that when I showed them this video. Believe me, you're going to be just like the person I talked to because you will look for answers. You will look for ways to rationalize these things that I show you. Just understand, I've asked the same questions why how and what am i really seeing this guy with the red shirt looks like his shirt is being pulled by a wire there are lots of these instances out there that you can research but it's not exclusive to the iss it also happened on the moon itself and i'll show you that in a moment but look at the guy in the middle of these men he looks like he's actually wearing a harness this was a live interview with boise state and look at how awkward this is Look at this astronaut who turns with his back to us. Pay attention to his back heels. It seems like there may not be enough slack so his heels stay off the ground. Okay, maybe that's hard for you to believe or see, but look at this awkwardness. This astronaut looks like he's being yanked up by a cable. So how does he get up like this on his own? I mean, the other astronaut did not pull him, but it looks like he was lifted by some external force outside of him, and it's not the guy next to him. Straight up, it appears that these astronauts are attached to cables or some kind of harnesses at times because it pulls the astronauts in unnatural ways. It even prevents them from falling all the way down. Sometimes they look like puppets on strings due to the way that they're being pulled or moved along. But how else could they be doing this? Well, it could be more special effects and likely something called augmented reality and or green screens. And this is what it looks like. This is an actual video that NASA did. They meant to do this. This is an example of augmented reality. And then there are chroma key screens. So outside of green screens, there are also blue screens. And that's what you're seeing right here. You're seeing the former president being pushed through this NASA area. And behind him is Tim Peake, an astronaut, with what looks like a blue screen, a chroma key screen right behind him. And do you see the green ball? I mean, we can compare footage around that same time compared to what was caught on camera. And you can see it's the same background. It looks like the same deal. And I've only ever found one other video that's ever shown this same checkered blue screen. This is that one other video that I'm showing you right here. But how coincidental is it that they use this blue checkered background, which is extremely similar to ORAD virtual set technology. I mean, this is the kind of stuff you can do on a budget right here, this video. Now here's something else from the ISS. Look at this card floating. This is directly from NASA's YouTube channel. 
this card, it just doesn't look real. Is there an air conditioner on up there? I mean, look at it. It looks like they're doing everything they can not to laugh. Next, people say that the spacewalks may have been recorded underwater and not on the moon at all. Because, as you can see here, astronauts are definitely trained underwater. So a lot of folks believe that they may have faked the spacewalks by doing it underwater as well. And that seems to make a lot of sense when you study a lot of the spacewalk videos. Because... You're going to see what looks like a lot of bubbles going all these different directions. Who knows which direction the camera was actually pointing when these were recorded, but they look like air bubbles escaping maybe from underwater pools where some of these things were recorded or faked. Last, there are zero gravity planes. The only way right now that we can simulate the gravity on Moon, Mars, asteroids is parabolic flight. So yeah, there is likely hours of video of real weightlessness that people have experienced. But you can't do that all the time. So there needs to be other options, especially for the longer videos, like I showed before. Okay, this is a time-lapse video of Earth recorded from the ISS. But I want to step off the space station right now. I want to look at the Apollo 11 crew's first public appearance after returning from the moon. It was our pleasure to have participated in one great adventure. It's an adventure that took place not just in the month of July, but rather one that took place in the last decade. We all here and the people listening in today had the opportunity to share that adventure over its developing and unfolding in the past months and years. It's our privilege today to share with you some of the details of that final month of July that was certainly the highlight for the three of us of, of that decade. So a lot of people question that video and the emotions that they showed at this press conference, especially Neil Armstrong, who was in the middle. But yeah, it looks like maybe they were impacted by being on the moon. That could be a significant moment. Just as a heads up, this news conference occurred on September 16th, 1969. And these astronauts returned to Earth on July 24th, 1969. So yeah, it's less than two months for them to get their bearings. But it turns out that they did forget a lot in that short time frame. When you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the Sona Corolla what, what stars we could see. I can't imagine that he was debriefed and that kind of question wasn't asked. What he saw, what he felt, what he experienced while on the moon. And now listen to Mike Collins, who was sitting to the left of Neil Armstrong. I don't remember seeing any. Neil, you were uh, a little bit concerned you said about... So now Mike doesn't remember seeing any stars either. We have to remember that the reporter asked about them looking up at the sky and if they could see the stars based on the circumstances. So Mike Collins' answer has got to apply to his experience in the command module itself because he didn't walk on the moon or go down to its surface. But let's look again at Neil's response to what Mike said. I don't remember seeing any. Neil, you were uh, a little bit concerned you said about Notice his body language, and it looks like Neil even whispers something under his breath to Mike. Was he telling him to simply shut up? I don't know, but the interaction looks really odd to me. All right, here is another interview with Neil Armstrong. And right after I show you this quick piece, I'll immediately share a few more statements made by other astronauts who shared what they could or couldn't see while in outer space. 
Mr. Armstrong, I do realize that when you were on the moon, you had very little time for gazing upwards. But could you tell us something about what the sky actually looks like from the moon, the sun, the earth, the stars, if any, and so on? The sky is uh, a deep black uh, when viewed from the moon, as it is when viewed from uh, cislunar space, the space between the earth and the moon. The uh, the Earth is the only visible object other than the Sun that can be seen, although there have been some reports of seeing planets. I myself did not see planets from the surface, but I suspect they might uh, be visible. Whilst in from Mark space, Cameron. This is from Mark Cameron. Whilst in space, have you ever looked away from Earth into the black void? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, because yeah, you time. can see yeah, because yeah. you can see the stars. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and uh, pretty much all the time you can see yeah. the stars. The sky is uh, a deep black uh, when viewed from the moon, as it is when viewed from uh, cislunar space, the space between the Earth and the moon. Space, and you're on the sun side of the orbit. Uh, the sunlight washes out all the starlight, so you can't see any stars, just like here on Earth. There's all the, there's all the stars there, and the cool thing is about it, you can see it during the day. Yeah, you can, and there's more than stars. You can see planets, you right. can see moons. You, you see the, ga the gas uh, Magellan clouds of yeah, the Milky yeah, Way galaxy. Yeah, yeah, you see Magellan. Pretty much all the time, you can see yeah, the stars. Yeah. Then when you look out into deep space away from the sun, it's the darkest black you can imagine. So this black space you're looking at on your screen right now could or couldn't be what you see when viewing outer space from outer space. I guess you have to go to outer space or walk on the moon to confirm this truth for yourself. But I'm going to stay focused on the objects in outer space because I want to ask why the images of stars and planets taken by satellites in space look so different to what I actually observe with my camera. Here's Venus again as seen through my Nikon P900. Here's Arcturus again. Here's Vega again. Here's another star, Antares. It looks pretty cool too. I showed you my online research earlier, except I can't find any video of these amazing stars or planets that were taken by NASA. Now we're looking at NASA's website. From a million miles away, NASA camera shows moon crossing face of Earth. It says a NASA camera aboard the Deep Space Climate Observatory Discover captured a unique view of the moon as it moved in front of the sunlit side of the Earth last month. The series of test images shows the fully illuminated dark side of the moon that is never visible from Earth. The images were captured by NASA's Earth Polychromatic Imaging Camera, EPIC, a 4 megapixel CCD camera and telescope on the Discover satellite orbiting one million miles from Earth. First off, that looks very similar to the same side of the moon that I look at. Be interested to know if it's identical. But here below it says, this animation features actual satellite images of the far side of the moon, illuminated by the sun, as it crosses between the Discover spacecraft's Earth polychromatic imaging camera EPIC and telescope. This is supposed to be the moon passing the Earth from a million miles away. Let's go back to the moon for a moment, because some have pointed out how there's no crater underneath the lunar module landing. The jet propulsion would have likely created a crater, or at least some type of big marking, from its landing. There isn't any dust anywhere though, not even on the legs or feet of the module. I would think that some kind of dust or rocks should have been blown around from the lunar module landing on the moon. Keep in mind that the module had a 10,000 pound thrust engine, except it seems to have left no disturbance underneath it. Also, Neil Armstrong is sitting on top of that engine when it's initially landing on the moon, but he's heard clear as day when they're landing. 60 seconds. Lights on. Forward. Forward. 40 feet down, two and a half, picking up some dust, straight shadow, four forward, drift into the right a little, 30 seconds, forward, just. contact light, okay, engine stop, we copy you down, Eagle, Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here, 
The Eagle has landed. And what about the fact that we're now planning to send humans to Mars and we want to colonize it? So forget about inhabiting the moon, which would be way easier because it's way closer and we've already put people on the moon. But instead, let's go inhabit Mars, which is much further away and way harder to get to. So everything I've shared so far, to me, it's really bizarre and odd. Much of it doesn't add up, if you ask me. But still, many of you will find explanations. There's a lot of info out there. But based on what my eyes have seen, based on using my own personal logic, even if I wanted to eliminate half of the things I just showed you as untrue, I simply can't explain away the other half as untrue because there is too much that just doesn't make sense in my head. But after looking over all of the information and evidence surrounding our explorations into outer space, the moon landings, and what science teaches me about it all, based on what I can actually observe and prove myself, I'm now at the point where I don't believe we ever went to the moon. I don't believe we've gone to outer space in the way that they tell us. I don't believe an international space station is orbiting the Earth. I don't believe it's possible. And there are many more extremely compelling reasons why I believe this, beyond the limited information that I've presented so far here. We only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. The moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to. And this certainly has to be the most historic telephone call ever made from the White House. I just can't tell you how proud we all are of what you have done. Thank you, Mr. President. It's a great honor and privilege for us to be here. A journey to another planet, a manned mission to Mars. I should tell you that the first mission is scheduled to land on Mars on July the 4th, 1997, Independence Day. We will undertake extended human missions to the moon as early as 2015, with the goal of living and working there for increasingly extended periods of time. Human missions to Mars and to worlds beyond. But I, I, I just have to say, uh, pretty bluntly here, we've been there before. There's a lot more of space to explore and a lot more to learn when we do. Now, last month, we launched a new spacecraft as part of a re-energized space program that will send American astronauts to Mars. We will establish a foundation for an eventual human mission, mission to, to Mars, Mars and perhaps someday to many and worlds, to worlds beyond. beyond if we dare to dream big. And that's what our country is doing again. We're dreaming big. It's real because it looks so fake.